Okay, so our first speaker is John Hopcroft, one of the pioneers of computer science, the author of the only book when I studied computer science that I still remember today, and is still one of the classics today. But he wants to have all the time, so we have still time for a few questions. Thanks for yeah. being with us. Uh, th thank you. It's, it's a pleasure to have this opportunity to talk to you this morning. And what, what I thought I would do uh, is I assume some of you maybe don't know anything about machine learning. So I'm going to give 10 minutes a very quick uh, course on machine learning, the very basics. And then in the last 20 minutes, I, I will give a number of interesting research problems that one might be uh, interested in. Uh, but, but to start with, uh, we're, we're undergoing an, an information uh, revolution. And uh, it's going to change our entire society. And machine learning is a major part of this. And one of the drivers is, is deep learning. So I'm going to start with a, a very short uh, course on, on machine learning. Uh, it started uh, with a threshold logic unit. Uh, which is a device which has a number of inputs. Uh, each input has a weight, and it calculates the product of the input times the weight, and then sums them up over all inputs, and compares that to a threshold. If it's less than the threshold, the output is zero. If it's greater, the output is, is one. And there's a very simple algorithm for training this device uh, to classify uh, inputs. And wh what you do is initially you set the weight vector equal to maybe the first uh, pattern, input pattern. And then you uh, look at each input pattern a number of times to see if they're uh, correctly classified. If they're not correctly classified and you want that input to output a one, then you add the pattern to the weight vector Otherwise, you subtract it. And what's important about this slide is just one thing, is this bottom here. That notice that the weight vector will be a linear combination of patterns. It's because every time you change the weight vector, you either add or subtract a pattern to it. And if the data is linearly separable, uh, the algorithm will quickly uh, find a weight vector which will correctly classify all the patterns. But most of your data is not linearly separable. So what do you do uh, if you have data like this, where you want to separate the x's from the o's? One obvious thing is to map it to a higher dimensional space where it would be linearly separable. And one way to do that in this particular case is to add a third dimension z, where the value of z for each input is the sum of the squares of the x value and the y value. That would pull the zeros out from the board more than the x's, and you could separate the zeros from the x's by a plane parallel to the board. Now, uh, one, one of the things when you map to a higher dimensional space, it may actually even be an infinite dimensional space. And the important thing is that you do not need to compute uh, the images of the patterns. You don't even need to know what the function f is. Uh, what you're going to do is you're going to train the network using the algorithm of the earlier slide uh, in this higher dimensional space. And what I will show you is the only thing you need is the product of, of images. So I map this image ai uh, with the function f to f of ai. And the weight vector in this higher dimensional space will be a linear combination of the mappings of the images. And now if I want to test to see whether some image aj is correctly classified, when I multiply the weight vector times f of aj, Notice that the only thing that appears on the right-hand side is products of mappings. And if I knew those products, I would not have to know what the function f is. And if a pattern is uh, incorrectly classified, all I want to do is add f of aj to the weight vector. And to do that, 
All I do is increase the coefficient of cj by 1. So I never need to know the function f. So what you might do is uh, use what's called a kernel. It's just a matrix whose elements are the products of the mappings of images. And then you might ask the question, if I don't need to know the function f, could I just use any matrix that I want? Well, you have to make sure that there exists some function which would give rise to that matrix. And it turns out, it's easy to show, uh, that uh, the requirement is, is that that matrix be positive semi-definite. If it, if, if it is, there exists a function. If, if it isn't positive semi-definite, then there is no function. So one possible matrix you might use uh, is what's called the Gaussian kernel. And notice it's very easy to calculate uh, the element kij, which is the product of f of a sub i and f of a sub j. Uh, you just calculate this, you subtract the two patterns, square it, and raise e to some that power. Okay. So this, this is basically the essence of the uh, support vector machine. Uh, there exists many kernels besides the Gaussian kernel. But what I want to do is I want to move on to, to deep learning, because this is where the next advance is. Okay. So uh, what, what really the major advance in deep learning uh, came about due to ImageNet competition. And what was important here is uh, there was a data set of 1.2 million images that was being used that came from a thousand categories, like cat, dog, airplane, car, things like that. So there was a contest where you were given some training data. You would develop your network and train uh, your network. And then we'd see how, how well you would do on some test data. And up until 2011, uh, the error rate was uh, greater than 25%. And improvements were in a, an amount which was just a small percentage of a percent. But then uh, a particular network, AlexNet, in 2012, uh, dropped the error rate to 15%. Uh, this, this was a tremendous gain. And this is what uh, really brought the interest to, to deep learning. A couple years later, GoogleNet reduced the error to 6.7. And the following year, ResNet got it down to 3.57. And uh, if you train a human being to try to classify these images, their error rate is about 5%. So now these networks can classify images better than a, a trained human, human being. Okay. So just uh, I'm going to now start talking about things which uh, lead to some interesting research questions. Uh, we've been talking about what's called supervised learning. Uh, you need a large number of images which are labeled, and you can train the network using that data. But then people started uh, observing that you can do unsupervised learning. Uh, instead of trying to classify the category of an image, why don't you have a network where you put an image in and you try to reproduce the image? And what that uh, will do is that will develop uh, representations of, of the image here. Uh, and it turned out that someone who was experimenting noticed in one case uh, that a certain uh, sets of, uh, well, let, let me say something that's not quite correct, that, that a gate here would respond only if it was an image of a cat. And nobody had ever told this network which images had cats and which did not. And so there is the possibility of unsupervised uh, learning. Uh, the network is actually that that you use depends on whether you're doing processing images or whether you're doing speech or whether you're dealing with other kinds of data. But I'm, I'm going to restrict my comments to, to images. And in images, we use something uh, in the early levels called convolution levels. 
And what we have is we have a, a little window here. Uh, typically, it's five by five, but uh, just to get it on the slide, I made it a little smaller. And it's, you slide it across the pattern and then down a level and across. And for the uh, cells that are scanned, you connect them to a gate. And it turns out that the weights for this gate are identical to the weights for this gate. So as you slide this, this uh, window across, uh, you're trying to find some particular feature. And since you want to find many different features, you have many sets of these gates, uh, of these windows. One set here, one set here, and you may have a hundred or a thousand. So that gives you some idea of the size of these networks. Uh, then uh, to reduce, try to keep the network down a little in size, they add something which they called a pooling level, where they also have a little window, but now they uh, uh, take the four elements which are scanned and either pick the maximum or the average, something like that. And AlexNet uh, was made up with about five of these convolution levels and then uh, a few number, a few sets of fully connected levels and then a device called SoftMax which actually uh, classified uh, the, the image. Now, one of the things I want to talk about is something called activation space. And activation space, if I put an image in here and I take a vector, which is the output of these gates, uh, I'll have something which is called the activation vector. And I'm going to actually talk about two different kinds of activation vectors. Because what you really have is you have a matrix of values. I have every image across here, every gate down here, and in here the matrix gives me the output of a particular gate for a particular image. And what I might do is I might take a column, and I'll call that an image activation vector, because that will give me the output of every gate for that image. But I could have taken a row where I would have gotten, uh, for a particular gate, the output for every image. And I'm going to use different, sometimes I'll be using rows, sometimes I'll be using columns. Given an image, it's easy to calculate the activation vector. But what, what if you gave me the activation vector and asked what image produced this activation vector? Now, researchers have developed a number of different ways of doing this. I'm going to take one which is easy to explain. What you might do is take a random image and find out the activation vector for the random image, and then do gradient descent on the pixels of this image to move this activation vector to the activation vector that you want to reconstruct the image for. And if you do that, uh, you will move this random image to the image that produced uh, this activation vector. Now, the, the reason I want to do this uh, is I, if I take an image, what I can do is I can take the activation vector here and say this is the content of the image. And I can go out here and take this activation vector and take the product with itself, which will give me a matrix. And I'm going to use that matrix. I'm going to call that the style of the image because that tells me how adjacent pixels uh, are correlated. Then what, what researchers have done uh, is they take an image, like we took one here of George Bush, and we took the activation vector at the beginning of the network to represent the content of George Bush. Then we took 200 images of older people, and we took the average of their activation vectors for the style and said, what would George Bush look like if he was 10 years older? And uh, so when we recreated it, this was the image that we got. 
and a lot of people are doing research like this, uh, it turns out that each year I bring 30 or 40 students from China over to the United States to expose them to a U.S. university. And these are people who are under, undergraduates. And this year, uh, we had them do some research projects on deep learning. And uh, one of the students took a picture of Cornell University and asked the question, what would Cornell University look like if it was in Shanghai? And so they took a piece of Asian artwork and used that for the style of this photograph. And this is what Cornell presumably might look like if it was in Shanghai. Uh, by the way, this, this is a junior, and he had only 20 days to do something and had never dealt with deep uh, learning before. Uh, research of this type, uh, this here is, is a photograph of, of Cornell. And these are some pieces of artwork whose style we could use to recreate this image. And there are two rows here where things are recreated. Uh, when people first did this, they used trained networks. And the difficulty with that is it takes a couple of weeks to train a network. So we asked the question, uh, could you do this without training? What if you just used random weights and tried this experiment? And what you would get is this second row uh, and what this suggests is many things that we're doing with these deep networks uh, depend on the network rather than on the training of the network. And so an interesting research question is which things actually require training and which don't. For example, if you could compare the st two structures using random weights, then you could compare thousands of structures to see which were the best. Whereas now, it, where it takes two weeks to compare two structures, you, you can't really do that effectively. And what I'm doing now is I'm just going to talk about different uh, research uh, questions. Uh, things you might want to do is ask, what do individual gates learn? Um, do the gates at one level, first level learn something different than the second level? How does what a gate learns evolves over time? And I'll mention that one of these juniors looked at this issue, uh, but what he did is he took a simple network and simple images. His images were just 10 by 10 rather than 256 by 256. And his images were just, uh, the pixels were either black or white. And he was recognizing uh, uh, characters, uh, letters of the alphabet. And what he observed as he was training the network is that three gates started to learn the same thing. But after a few iterations, two of the gates apparently said, it doesn't make sense for us to learn the same thing this other gate is learning, and then switched and started to learn something else. And an interesting research question is why? How did they figure out that what they were doing wasn't worthwhile? And how did they pick something new to learn? Uh, and these are just things. Uh, for example, if you're dealing with photographs, uh, the first level doesn't learn something about your photographs. It learns things about photographs in general. And so if you have another set of photographs later, maybe you don't have to retrain the first level because it's, it already has weights which learn something about photographs. So one question you might address is, do two gates learn the same thing? And what you would simply do is calculate the covariance of the activation vectors for those two, two gates. And uh, if the number turns out close to one, the gates are learning something similar. If it's close to zero, completely different. So you'll get a matrix like this with a bunch of numbers, and you look for numbers like 0 0.9, and what you will discover is there may be a gate in one network which is learning the same thing as a gate in another network. There'll be a few gates, pairs of gates like this, but then you'll get down to gate numbers f three and four that don't seem to be learning specifically what a gate in the other network is, is learning, 
but the two gates together are learning the same thing as two gates in the other uh, network. And what the, apparently what they're doing is just having a different set of basis vectors. They're learning the same subspace, but a different representation for it. Uh, one of the things in training uh, a deep network is that there are many local minima. And the question is, which one do you want? Uh, some are better than others. And uh, so what I'm going to do is uh, uh, some people have conjectured why some local minima are better. Uh, some local minima are very sharp and very uh, narrow. Others are broader. And it seems that the broader uh, local minima are better. So, so here, here is one local minima, and here is the other. If you look at the value of the local minima, they're the same. But which one is going to generalize better? If, if this, is, this is the training error, and what I'm interested in is what is going to be the, the test error. And uh, what people are conjecturing is that since my training data is a reasonable statistical sample of the complete data, if I were to replot this curve the training error for the complete data, I'd get a curve which is very similar, but just slightly different. So uh, I'll put it in here in dotted lines. Now notice that the error, the change in error here for this broad minimum is very little. Uh, so this, this was a good local minima, but over here, because this is a very narrow minima, uh, the generalization is, is very bad. The error went up uh, significantly. Um, also, in talking about training, uh, there are different versions of gradient descent. Uh, you, you have a, an error, which is a sum, and people have maybe 100,000 images in their uh, training data, so you're taking, you're calculating the derivative of a sum of 100,000 elements. Now, what you might do instead uh, is instead of calculating precisely, uh, you might just pick one image, start your minimization on that, then pick a different image and uh, cycle through the images or randomly select images. Or you might even pick a, a small batch of images uh, each, each time. And what would happen uh, if you do real gradient descent and your weight vector starts over here, uh, you're going to find this first local minima. Uh, but you might want to get one of these other local minima. Uh, if you pick uh, one image at a time, you'll bounce around trying to move down into these, but you'll be somewhere uh, maybe closer to the middle. And if you want to reduce the variance, uh, then you'll take a batch of maybe 100 images at a time and take their, take their average. Okay. Uh, I'm going to move, since I don't want to run out of time, one question you might be interested in, if you have two tasks to learn, should you learn them separately or should you learn them at the same time? Uh, this you might think of in case of a human that learns uh, a language when they're a child, and then another language when they're an adult, as opposed to a child who learns both languages as a child. And if you image the brain, if they learn both languages as a child, it'll be one point in the brain where the activity is. If you learn one as a child and one as an adult, it's two separate locations in the brain. So you might want to explore things, and the question you might ask is, how do I learn what is common to these two problems? And so you might set your network up something like this, where you've picked, taken some of the gates and made them common. And what these gates learn will probably be the things which are common to the two tasks. Uh, these up here, which are, correspond just to this task and these just to this task. So there are things you can do uh, in uh, looking at various tasks and comparing them. Uh, th this just talks about the child, which I already mentioned, so I'll, I'll move on. Uh, another interesting area is something called adversarial networks. 
suppose I want to generate uh, pictures which are realistically look realistic. Uh, I might have an image generator and it might not do a very good job. So I create a, a discriminator which can tell the difference between a generated image and a real image. So I train this to tell the difference. Then what I do is I train this entire network so that this image generation can fool the synthesizer. And then I train the synthesizer to do better, but eventually what you end up with is an image generator which generates reasonable images. So another application of this, because there are thousands of applications people are trying, what if I wanted to make a translator from English to German? Uh, what I would do first is create something which takes an English sentence and just produces German words. Then I have a discriminator which tells me whether this is just a random set of German words or a German sentence. And then I take a translator from German into English and when I train this entire network I try to make sure that the sentence you put in here comes out here. And what this will force it to do is produce a German sentence here and this, the, the fact that I'm trying to get the same thing back, it will make it this a translation of what you put in. And before, when people were trying to create ways to translate from one language to another, they got two document, two copies of the same document, one in English and one in German. Now they don't need two documents in, in uh, they don't need two copies of the same document. Uh, people try to do uh, compression. Uh, they know with a smaller network they're not able to train it. But one thing you might do is train a deeper network and use that training to train this smaller network and see if that will work. Uh, I'm just going quickly because I just want to show you that there's lots of uh, questions you might explore. Uh, one of them is a, a child can learn from a single image. I showed my daughter when she was about five uh, an image of a fire engine from something called the best word book ever. Next day she was out and she saw a fire engine on the street. She pointed to it and said fire engine. She learned from one image. Uh, we're learning from thousands of images. Can we've, after we've learned how to learn about images, because my daughter had seen billions of images in the first five years, can you learn how to learn from a single image? Uh, you might be concerned, you probably heard that people could take a, an image of a cat and change a few pixels so that you can't even see that it's a different image and all of a sudden the deep network says it's an automobile. And this, this worried people at first, but I don't think you have to worry about it because if you take this image, uh, the modified image of the cat, it doesn't look like an image to a deep network because there's a pixel which is not re correlated with the adjacent pixels. And if you simply take the modified image and pass it through a filter, then it will get reclassified correctly. Now, one of the things people ask me is, artificial intelligence, uh, is it real? What's really happening in the case of uh, deep learning is we're doing pattern recognition in high dimensional space. And uh, the network doesn't learn anything about the function of the image. So if you show it bicycles, it recognizes them by what they look like, not by what their function is. Uh, another revolution may occur in 40 years where we extract the function of something. But let's say you trained an, uh, some, uh, uh, to recognize railroad cars and engines and you showed it this picture. Uh, it would probably classify this either as a box car or a flat car with something on it. It's actually a, an engine because there's, just, there's no cab, there's no person drives it because it's a remote controlled engine. Uh, so when people ask, is, is, uh, what is deep learning intellectual, uh, it just deals with the shape of the image, not with the image itself. And just one last slide, uh, many things that, you know, if you're playing uh, a game and the computer is outperforming you, well really what it's doing is it's creating a, a tree of all possible moves 
and it can search that tree faster than you can, and that's why it can beat you. So I, I hope that what I did is suggested to you that there's a large number of interesting research problems, and I see I just got cut off in time, so thank you. Thanks a lot for this interesting talk, and thanks a lot for sticking to the time, so we may have a few questions, especially from young researchers. Hi, um, thanks for the talk. Um, it seems that in deep learning, especially in these examples that you showed for um, image recognition, there's a lot of architecture going on a lot of neural networks um, architecture, like the ResNet, et cetera. There's a lot of reasoning for which layers should you put together. Um, is it possible to, to do a step further and, and um, come up with a network that learns not only the weights, but also the correct architecture, the correct um, model to, to solve the, the, your problems? Uh, you mean the, the correct architecture that you should use in the deep network? Uh, there, I, I, I haven't seen any research on, on that specifically. What they do now, though, is they look at which architectures you can train uh, e more easily. If they're, they're up to a thousand levels deep. And if you try to do gradient descent, it's, it's not going to work. Uh, so what they do is they randomly uh, drop out certain levels as they're training. And, and there's a lot of work in, in that particular area. Uh, I, I guess what I should also tell you is, is that there are thousands of researchers in this area, but most of them are concerned with applications, and they've been very successful, just incredibly successful. Uh, but there aren't that many researchers who are trying to explain why they're so successful. Yeah. We haven't heard a single question with a female voice yet. Can we change that? Please. Okay, after the next talk, perhaps. Uh, thank you. Yes, yes. Um, hi, um, I'm Larissa Suzuki. I do research on smart cities. Um, I was wondering, like, if you have had any experience in applying deep learning research into smart cities and how you see this as something that can change the world and you know save like humankind in the future oh uh, <laughs> this 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 is a, is another topic but it's going to change the world uh people people realize that we're going through a revolution now which is going to be equivalent in impact to that of the agricultural revolution or the industrial revolution and uh, co some countries are asking what percentage of our population is are going to be needed to produce all the goods and services we need and they figure it's very small and so they're thinking about universal guaranteed income uh, they're thinking about how do they engage the population in meaningful activities because they don't want them sitting around doing nothing so um, in addition to the research in, in deep learning, people better start thinking about how to restructure society, because it's going to be different. OK, I can't resist. Last question. Um, hi, my name is Fatma Deniz. Um, my question is actually going towards uh, what you were saying with the uh, why. Um, these networks are performing well. So I'm, myself, I'm, I'm a computation neuroscientist. And, I'm interested if you have any insights about the applications that are currently available more and more that we see that the neural networks are um, applied to brain data as well to explain, let's say, visual, visual, visual cortex activity, et cetera. So do you have any comments on those research? No, no I think maybe the next talk might, uh, might, might address this a little. Um, I, I focus just on images because in, in 30 minutes, that's all I could do. But, but they're used in, you know, in financial data, in, in all kinds of data, and, and, and they're successful. They're incredibly successful. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thanks a lot once again. Thank